In this final session, we will consider current guidelines and how we think they need to be modified. Matthias, what do the guidelines tell us we should be doing? Well, uh, after the uh, FAME FAME 2 trials, there was uh, it came out a very strong recommendation to use uh, physiology uh, to assess coronary lesions, especially if you don't have any previous stress tests indicating ischemia. So, uh, with that said, we have a very low uptake of FFR today, uh, so we're cur currently actually not uh, following the, uh, the very strong indications we do have. Furthermore, the indications actually are based on a population of stable angina patients. So, uh, if you have a practice where you have a lot of stable angina patients, uh, you do have uh, strong guidelines with a good scientific basis to tell what you should do. However, in most practices today, most of the patients are ACS patients. So even though there's guideline recommendations, there's actually not too much scientific data supporting the use of physiology in that setting. Okay. Devarka, um, figures, specific figures in the guidelines. So, yes, the 2014 ESC guidelines make a class one recommendation for either having non-invasive evidence of ischemia or uh, an FFR less than 0 0.8 for any lesion that's less than 90% diameter stenosis, which really, if applied, covers the whole spectrum of, of uh, you know, intermediate lesions. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very strong uh, mandate or recommendation that we should be getting ischemia assessment, physiological intracoronary assessment or non-invasive assessment in all these patients. Are there differences between the European and American guidelines? Does anyone know? I'm not aware so. of that. Okay. So my point is that um, the problem we have is that even non-invasive testing, which we traditionally use if used in ordinary treadmill test, is not a very good predictor of ischemia. We, we both overestimate and underestimate ischemia. So um, the current disconnect between the guidelines is the fact that we, we tell that if you have positive uh, stress tests, you can go ahead and, and actually do PCI, but that may actually not be a valid point just because uh, you do have a lot of false positives. So if you do have intermediate lesions still, should you perform a PCI or not? So I would actually go further and say that the guidelines are actually not really updated because they don't have a sound scientific basis because we do know that uh, FFR is actually better than the non-invasive stress testing today, possibly with the exception for stress CMR, which is a very promising new uh, non-invasive test, but the, the, the one we use in, in ordinary clinical practice are actually not very good. So I would say if you do have a patient where you have diffuse symptoms, you should be very liberal, dis regardless what the stress test said, to perform uh, yeah, I, physiology. I, I, yeah, I think I have to pay, take, take the standpoint of the guidelines here. The guidelines are not mandating that you're not allowed to do FFR if you have a non-invasive test of ischemia. I mean, if you have any doubts, you, you're still you know, invited to go ahead and do FFR. It just means don't typically do FFR, sorry, don't typically do PCI unless you have non-invasive proof of ischemia or, as you say correctly, if the lesion is less than 90%, you have FFR that demonstrates ischemia. That's right. And if I could just pick up on, on, on th that important point that you made, the difference between non-invasive and, and FFR. Most of the non-invasive tests, including stress perfusion MR, fare much better on a per patient basis than a per lesion or per territory basis. So if you're actually trying to use that test to guide us in telling us which or how many vessels to treat, I don't think it is as useful as FFR. If you want a lesion specific, vessel specific measurement, then you know we've got a great tool uh, in our armamentarium. And that's particularly true in multivessel disease. If you have multivessel disease, the probability right of failing with an non-invasive test is much higher. Okay. So I would just like to say my point is that what the guideline says is really be liberal with using a pressure wire, but the, the, the greater recommendation is, is really difficult to implement in another setting, just saying that if you have any doubts whatsoever that this specific lesion has an issue, ischemia, you use the pressure wire, 
So, and even in the stable angina population, we, we do have almost 50% of patients uh, that have multivessel disease. So even though you do have one lesion which is suspected to give ischemia, if you have, for instance, stress CMR, you're still not completely sure about the other lesion or if there are more than one lesion. So it's, it's really, uh, my point is from a practical standpoint, it just tells us to be very liberal with using FFR. Okay. So we'll come to where we think the guidelines should be shortly, but I'm getting the message that we're already not doing enough to meet the current guidelines. So Joe, can you give us an idea of what we think the gap is between where we currently are in terms of the use of coronary physiology and where we should be with the current guidelines? Well, um, we all have this idea that uh, current usage is very low, but uh, that's the first problem because we don't actually know how to assess that because usually what uh, we are doing is we are comparing the number of FFR procedures performed as compared to the number of PCIs. And that is probably not the right way to do it. You should compare the number of uh, physiological evaluations as to the total number of intermediate lesions you, you would have. And if you do that, probably Probably the numbers are even lower than, than the ones uh, we, we actually have. I think there is a great variability between countries. In the US, the number is raising uh, faster, faster uh, since this last year. But in Europe, probably we have a very low number of uh, procedures being performed for different reasons, for reimbursement reasons in some countries, uh, for because the current uh, um, Interventional cardiologists were teached in a different way as the new ones are being teached uh, because there is an incentive to perform PCI. You, there are for sure many reasons for this, uh, for this, uh, for this. Since you have guidelines that clearly stated that you should perform this uh, the physiological evaluation in intermediate lesions, so uh, we clearly need to uh, to um, explain to. This message, must, this message must be much much more clear to all the international cardiologists that when you are treating a lesion that doesn't need to be treated, you may be arming the patient. And that needs to be clearly understood. Yeah, okay. And I think it should be clearly understood for those who don't do FFR that it's not such a terrible procedure to perform. I think in many cases there are probably entire labs that don't perform FFR because they're not used to the procedure, they don't know the procedure, they think it's awfully cumbersome and takes a long time. But once you have, you know, in your lab, set up the logistics and really removed all the obstacles to using it, typically patients, uh, in the, uh, physicians become very comfortable with the measurement and then start using it. I, I think we have to get people to use FFR um, and, and I think entire labs need to be turned around to become FFR labs that, that do FFR by providing the logistics, you know, keeping the threshold to saying, let's measure an FFR in this patient as low as possible. Right. I mean, I think it should become part of the diagnostic process, almost an extension of the angiogram, which we've thought of as, as the sort of first diagnostic test. In, in our lab and in my view, um, I think it's not acceptable to do a diagnostic angiogram and then report a doubt. You really need to um, have clarity on whether what uh, the, the lesions that you found are significant or not. That does raise the slightly more difficult issue, though, of who should be doing doing uh, FFR measurements. I mean, we've said that uh, introducing a pressure wire is a safe thing to do, but that's in the hands of people who introduce intracoronary guide wires all the time. So that's a slightly difficult issue which we, as a community, will have to deal with if we were to expand the paradigm for it to become, you know, part of the diagnostic process. So I, I mean, this is not only true for FFR, it's true for many of the, the recommendations we have, both in the ACCH and the EC, is that even though we have recommendations, they're not always followed by the community. And, and one way to actually work around that problem is to do what we did in the SCAR uh, registry, is that we actually have a quality assurance index. So, um, for instance, we, we do know that 2014 we had about 25% penetration rate of FFR in a stable angina population. And where is that? In Sweden. Sweden. So it's a fairly high, but at the same time we have a huge variation from above, above 50% to less than 5% if you're looking at all the 30 different sites we have in Sweden. So one way of getting around that is introducing a quality assurance index. So where you decide to cut off 
where you actually start get, getting quality assurance points for uh, for performing FFR. So, so if you have a, a public uh, presentation about that, you present it on websites and on the in the annual report, we can actually grade the different sites depending on the number of physiology measurements they do. And that's a much stronger incentive yeah. to increase than, than the guidelines themselves, even though it shouldn't be. What do you think a reasonable percentage would be? Which, which percentage of diagnostic angiograms in a stable population should receive FFR? Just approximately figure. Should be 70% or 25%? Well, that's a hundred thousand dollar question, isn't it? I mean, the, I gave you no, a wide range too. <laughs> no, no one really knows. I, I mean, the, the simple question, a simple answer is definitely more than what we're doing today. Um, let's just assume that we have, in the near future, we have more appropriate non-invasive testing, and we implement it, such as stress CMR and CT FFR. That would mean that we have a different population coming to the cath lab than we do now, which is a major problem. We have too many uh, where we had normal and near normal angiograms. So saying that, we actually changed the population to a more appropriate population for angiography on. That will probably mean still that we have a population with 40 to 50 percent with multi vessel disease. So even though if we know that they have a positive stress test, we will still have to perform some sort of functional measurement in, I think, at least 50% of those patients. So it's, it, like I said, it's really difficult to tell, but we might actually have, talk about about 50% of patients. The same thing, ACS patients, even though we don't have a broad scientific basis for that, uh, at least in the SCAR registry, about 40 to 45% of patients with ACS have multivessel disease. This means that you should definitely think about physiology in the remaining lesions, especially if they're intermediate, which the majority is. So in SAS patients, we're talking about at least 30 to 40 percent of those who should have physiology. And is that going to start to be introduced into the guidelines? You're asking me? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, of course, with guidelines work with data. As data becomes available, data guidelines will be updated. So producing data, a good um, uh, reproducible data, that's the key to getting the procedure into the guidelines. Mm. I mean, there's reasonable data for ACS and, and pressure wire. Right. I mean, the new uh, non-STEMI guidelines will appear in the summer. Um, will be presented at the ESC conference in London. Right. And I personally don't know the content, but we will have to have a look in August and see what happens. Okay. So clearly we need to increase the number of uh, coronary physiology procedures we're doing. And I think the quality assurance is a great idea. How else are we going to get the numbers up? I think the key is really to keep the threshold as low as possible in the cath lab. We're learning, we're learning how these procedures can be done with less effort. We are looking at intravenous injection or intravenous in infusion of adenosine versus intracoronary application, and we're learning that with a few exceptions, they're absolutely comparable. And intracoronary is a lot easier to administer in the cath lab than IV. We're learning, if you think about IV, uh, just the publication uh, that was in Jack Intervention this week, that giving it in, with a sheath into the groin, which is the standard way of, of, of administration, gives exactly the same results as putting a small IV needle in, in the back of the hand even. Yeah. No difference in a large patient cohort. So we're learning how to make this procedure easy, and I think this is, what, this is what needs to be out there. Instructions on how this procedure can be performed easily, yet reproducibly, safely, and accurately. And this will, I think, lower the threshold. I think there are steps that can be taken. There should always be a wire ready in the cath lab. There should always be the measurement equipment ready in the cath lab so that you don't have to wheel it in from somewhere else if you want to do the procedure, integrate it into, into your angiography system or have it sitting there right there. There should always be, I've talked to other people who do IV, they say, you know, we always have a syringe ready. Uh, we just need to switch on the, 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 the injection pump, and there's really no effort. Or we do intracoronary, and it has greatly changed our, our rate of doing um, um, FFR measurements. So keep the thresholds in the cath lab as low as possible, and provide the data that shows how much the procedure can be simplified, yet still be accurate. I think this is what's going to help the tr uh, penetration tremendously. Uh, and I think um, re-emphasizing the health economic argument will help uh, institutions to adopt this more as well, that it's a cost saving measure in the long run. Well, the institutions don't care too much about cost saving typically because for them reimbursement is more important. Yeah. Probably the insurers have to be convinced of health 
cost economic benefits, and then insurers will turn around and provide reimbursement, and then the institutions, of course, will pick it up more easily. And I'll, I also think it's a, a teaching point from those who are physiology experts that uh, we should, when we perform the clinical trials, we should move away from the dichotomous um, cut-off points because it's really not a question of using an index as a stop sign saying that we shouldn't or we should do PCI. It's a question of integrating as a part of our knowledge. So rather that we say physiology allows us to do appropriate PCI rather than it stops us from doing PCI. And I think it's a very important message when it comes to uptake of physiology. And the second one, of course, is the new indexes such as IFR that really allows us to map the entire coronary vessels quite quickly and easily to assess, especially those with diffuse disease or tandem lesions. So it's it's really a way of simplifying the, uh, the PCI procedure as well, not just a question of do or don't do PCI. And, and another important uh, question is that most of the ongoing major trials on coronary artery disease are using physiology. We have the ischemia trial ongoing using FFR. We have the syntax 2 uh, also ongoing, uh, besides the IFR trials ongoing. And so uh, for sure, uh, the, the guidelines we will have in the future will have to incorporate the information uh, in, of these studies. And that will also increase the confidence of operators using physiology. And then a second important uh, thing is, is the registries, like the French one or the Portuguese we, we did also uh, last year. So these registries clearly show that it's safe in a real world population to use this kind of strategy. And that will increase also, I think, the confidence of operators to, to use uh, uh, physiology in their decisions. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I think the summary of this last session is that we should not be using a cut-off threshold. We need to think about the information we're getting from physiological assessment. And finally, that we're, we're doing many fewer physiological assessments than, than we should do uh, by uh, a factor of possibly three or four times at least. Um, and, and one way that we can increase the number of procedures we're doing uh, appropriately is to reduce the difficulty of doing, uh, doing uh, physiological assessments. Uh, and perhaps IFR will come into that, but uh, on a broader front, we need to think about how we can uh, facilitate the introduction of physiological assessments into more labs. Thank you very much.